Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and Ingrained Values by Robert M. Piercing. Chapter 30. At Arcata, we enter a small diner, cold and wet, and eat chili and beans and drink coffee. Then we are back on the road again, freeway now, fast and wet. We'll, we'll go to within uh, an easy day's distance from San Francisco and then stop. Freeway picks up uh, strange reflections from the rain from oncoming lights across the, the median. The rain hits like pellets against the bubble which refracts the lights uh, in a strange circular and then semicircular waves as they go by. 20th century. Uh, it's all around us now. It's 20th century. Ooh, this 20th century. Time to finish this 20th century odyssey of Phaedrus and be done with it. The next time the class in ideas and methods 250... The next time the class in ideas and methods 251 rhetoric met at the large round table in, in South Chicago, a department secretary announced that the professor of philosophy was ill. The following week he was still ill, and somewhat bewildered remnants of the class, which had dwindled to a third of its size, went on their own um, went on their own across the street for coffee. At the coffee table, a student who, whom Phaedrus had marked as bright but intellectually snob snobbish said, I consider this one of the most unpleasant classes I've ever been in. He seemed to look down on Phaedrus with, with womanish peevishness <laughs> as a spoiler of what should have been a nice experience. I thoroughly agree, Phaedrus said. He waited for some sort of attack, but it didn't come. Uh, the other students seemed to sense that Phaedrus was the cause of all this, but they had nothing to go on. Then an older woman at, at the other end of the coffee table asked why he was, atten asked why he was attending the class. I'm in the process of trying to discover that, Phaedrus said. Do you attend full-time? she asked. No, I teach full-time at, at Navy Pier. What do you teach? Rhetoric. She stopped talking and everyone at the table looked at him and became silent. November wore on. The leaves, which had turned to a, a beautiful sunlit orange in October, fell from the trees, leaving barren branches to meet the cold winds from the north. A first snow fell, then melted, and a drab city waited for winter to come. In the Professor of Philosophy's absence, another platonic dialogue had been assigned. Its title was Phaedrus, which meant nothing to, uh, to our Phaedrus since he didn't call himself by that name. The Greek Phaedrus is not a sophist, but a young orator who is a foil for Socrates in his dialogue, which is about the nature of love and the possibility of philosophic rhetoric. Phaedrus doesn't appear to be very bright, uh, and has an awful sense of rhetorical quality, since he quotes from memory a really bad speech by the, the orator Lysias. But one soon learns that this bad speech is simply a setup, an easy act for Socrates to follow with a much better speech of his own, and following that with a still better speech, one of the finest in all dialogues of Plato. Beyond that, the only remarkable thing about Phaedrus is his personality. Plato often names Socrates' foils um, for characteristics of their personality. A young, over-talkative, innocent, and good-natured foil to in, in the Georgias is named Polis, which is Greek for colt. Um, the horse, not the, <laughs> not the religious organizations that hold people against their will. Uh, Phaedrus's personality is different from this. He he is unallied to any particular group. He prefers the solitude of the country to the city. He is aggressive to the point of being dangerous. At one point, he threatens Socrates uh, Socrates with violence. Phaedrus in Greek means wolf. In this dialogue, he is carried away by Socrates's discourse on love and is tamed. Our Phaedrus reads the dialogue and is tremendously impressed by the magnificent po poetic imagery, but he's not tamed by it because it, it, he also smells it uh, in a faint odor of hypocrisy. The speech is not an end in itself, but is being used to condemn, condemn that s same effective domain of understanding it takes its rhetorical appeal to. The passions are characterized as the destroyer of understanding, and Phaedrus wonders if this is where the condemnation of of the passions so deeply buried in Western thought got its start. Probably not. The tension between ancient Greek thought and emotion was... Ancient Greek thought and emotion is described elsewhere as basic to Greek makeup and culture. Interesting, though. The next week, the professor of philosophy again does not appear, and Phaedrus uses the time to catch up on his work at the University of Illinois. The next week, in the University of Chicago bookstore across the, uh, across the street from where... He's about to attend class. Phaedrus sees two dark eyes that stare at him steadily through the sh a shelf of books. When the face appears, he recognizes it as a face of the innocent student who had been verbally beaten up earlier in the quarter and had disappeared. The face looks like, as though the student knows something Phaedrus doesn't know. 
Phaedrus walks over to talk, but the face retreats and goes out the door, leaving Phaedrus puzzled. And on edge. Perhaps he's just fatigued and jumpy. The exhaustion of teaching at a Navy Pier on top of the effort to outflank the whole body of Western academic thought in University of Chicago was forcing him to work and study 20 hours a day uh, with inadequate attention to food or exercise. It could just uh, it could be just fatigue that makes him think something is odd about that face. But when he walks across the street to the class, the face follows about 20 paces behind. Something is up. Phaedrus enters the classroom and waits. Soon, here, there comes a student again, back into the room after all these weeks. He can't expect to get credit to get credit now. The student looks at Phaedrus with half a smile. He's smiling at something, all right. At the doorway, there are some footsteps, and then Phaedrus suddenly knows, and his legs turn rubbery, and his hands start to shake. Smiling benignly in the doorway stands none other than chairman for the Committee on Analysis of Ideas and the Study of Methods at the University of Chicago. He is taking over the class. This is it. This is where they throw Phaedrus out the front door. Courtly, grand, with imperial um, magnum magnanimity, uh, the chairman stands in the fr in the doorway for a moment, then talks to a student that seems to know him. He smiles while looking away from the student around the classroom as if to find another face familiar to him, nods, and then chuckles a little, waiting for the bell to ring. That's why the kid is here. They've explained to him why they accidentally beat him up, and just to show what good guys they are, they're going to let him have a ringside seat while they beat up Phaedrus. How are they going to do it? Phaedrus already knows. First, they're going to destroy his status dialectically in front of the class by showing how little he knows about Plato and Aristotle. That won't be any trouble. Obviously, they know a hundred times more about Plato and Aristotle than he ever will. They've been, at it, they've been at it all their lives. Then, when they have thoroughly cut him up dialectically, they will suggest that either he either shape up or get out. Then they're going to ask some more questions, and he won't know the answer to, answers to those either. Then they're going to ask... Uh, going to suggest that he, he his performance is so abominable that he bother not to attend, but leave the class right now. There are variations possible, but this is the basic format. It's so easy. Well, he has learned a lot, which is what he came for. He can do his thesis in some other way. In that thought of, uh, in, in that thought, the, with that thought, the rubbery feeling leaves him and he calms down. Phaedrus has grown a beard since the chairman last saw him. And is still dignified and still unidentified. No long advantage. The chairman will locate him soon enough. The chairman lays his coat down carefully, takes a chair on the opposite side of the large round table, sits, and brings out an old pipe and stuffs it for what, for what must be nearly half a minute. One can see he has done this many times before. In a moment of attention to the class, he studies uh, face with smiling, hypnotic gaze, sensing the mood, but feeling it is not just right. He stuffs the pipe some more without hurry. Soon the moment arrives. He lights the pipe, and before long there is a classroom. Uh, there is in the classroom an odor of smoke. At last he speaks. It is my understanding, he says, that today we are going to begin discussion of the immortal Phaedrus. He looks at each student separately. Is that correct? Members of the class assure him timidly that it is. His persona is overwhelming. The chairman then apos apologizes for the absence of the previous professor, and describes the format of what will follow. Since he already knows the dialogue himself will elicit the class answers, that will show how well they have studied it. That's the best way to do it, Phaedrus thinks. That way one can learn to know the individual students. Fortunately, Phaedrus has uh, studied the dialogue so carefully it's almost memorized. The chairman is right. It is an immortal, it, it is an immortal dialogue strange and puzzling at first, but then hitting you harder and harder like truth itself. What Phaedrus has been talking about is quality. Socrates, who appears to have described the soul, self-moving, the source of all things, there is no contradiction. There never really can be between the core terms of monistic philosophies. The one in India has got to be the same as the one in Greece. If it's not, you've got two. The only disagreements among the monists uh, concern the attributes of of one, not the one itself. Since the one is the source of all things, and includes all things in it, it cannot be defined in terms of those things, since no matter what thing you use to define it, the thing will always describe something less than the one itself. The one only uh, the one can only be described as allegory, described allegorically, through the use of analogy, a figure's imagination and speech. Socrates chooses a heaven and earth analogy, showing how individuals are drawn towards one by a chariot drawn by two horses. But the chairman now directs a question to the next student 
to the student next to Phaedrus. He is baiting him a little, provoking him to attack. The student, whose identity is mistaken, doesn't attack, and the chairman, with great disgust and frustration, finally dismisses him with a rebuke that he should have um, read the material better. Phaedrus' turn. He has calmed down tremendously. He must now explain the dialogue. If I may be permitted to begin in my own way, he says, partly to conceal the fact that he didn't hear what the previous student said. The chairman, seeing this is a further rebuke to the student next to him, smiles and said contemptuously, it is certainly a good idea. Phaedrus proceeds. I believe in this dialogue the person of Phaedrus is character characterized as a wolf. He has delivered this quite loudly with, with a flash of anger, and the chairman almost jumps. Score. Yes, the chairman says with a gleam in his eye. Um, in his eye shows he now recognizes who this bearded assailant is. Phaedrus is a in Greek, does mean wolf. That's a very accurate observation. He begins to recover his composure. Proceed. Phaedrus meets Socrates, who knows only the ways of the city, and leads him into the county, country, whereupon he begins to recite a speech of the orator, Lysias, whom he admires. Socrates asks him to read it, um, uh, read it, and Phaedrus does. Stop, says the chairman, who's now completely recovered his composure. You're giving us a plot, not the dialogue. He calls into the next student. None of the students seem to know uh, to the chairman's satisfaction what the dialogue is about. And so with a mock sadness, he says uh, they must read more thoroughly, but this time he will help them by taking on the burden of explaining the dialogue himself. This provides an overwhelming uh, relief to the tension which he has so carefully built up in the entire class in the palm of his hand. The chairman proceeds to read it, to reveal the meaning of the dialogue with complete attention. Phaedrus listens with deep engagement. After a time, something begins to disengage him a little. A false note of, of some kind has crept in. At first, he doesn't um, see what it is, but then he becomes aware that the chairman has completely bypassed Socrates' description of one and has jumped ahead to the allegory of the chariot and the horses. In this allegory, the, the seeker, trying to reach the one, is drawn by two horses, one white and noble and temperate, and the other surly, stubborn, passionate, and black. Excuse me. The one is forever aiding him in his upward journey to the portals of heaven, and the other is um, forever confounding him. The, chariot, the chairman has not stated it, but he is at the point at which he must now announce that the white horse is tempered reason and the black horse is dark passion, emotion. The, he is at the point at which these must be described, but the false note suddenly becomes a chorus. He backs up and restates, Now Socrates has sworn th uh, to the gods that he is telling the truth. He has taken an oath to speak with the truth, and if what follows is not the truth, he has forfeited his own soul. Trap. He's using he is using the dialogue to prove the holiness of reason. Once the this, that's established, he can move on uh, to inquiries uh, of what reason is, and then lo and behold, there's there are there we are in Aristotle's domain again. Phaedrus raises his hand, palm flat out, elbow on the table, uh, where before his hand was shaking, now is deadly calm. Phaedrus senses that he is now formally signing his own death warrant here, but knows he will uh, sign another kind of death warrant if he takes his hand down. The chairman sees the hand, is surprised and disturbed by it, but acknowledges it. And then the message is delivered. Phaedra says, All this is just an analogy. Silence. Then confusion appears on the chairman's face. What? He says. The spell of his performance is broken. This entire description of the chariot and the horses is just an analogy. What? he says again then loudly it is the truth socrates has sworn to the gods that it is the truth phaedrus replies socrates himself says it's an, an, an analogy if you will read the dialogue then you will find that socrates specifically states it is the truth yes but prior to that in i believe two paragraphs he has stated that it is an analogy the text uh, on the table uh, the text is on the table to consult, but the chairman uh, has enough sense not to consult it. If he does, and Phaedrus is right, his classroom is completely demolished. He has told the class no one has read the book thoroughly. Rhetoric 1, dialectic 0. Fantastic, Phaedrus thinks, that he sh sh should have remembered that. It just demolishes the whole dialectical position. Uh, that may just be the whole show right there. Of course it's an analogy. Everything is an analogy, but the dialectics don't know that. That's why the chairman missed the statement of Socrates. Phaedrus is, uh, has caught it and remembered it. Because of Socrates, he, uh, because if Socrates hadn't stated it, he uh, wouldn't have been telling the truth. 
No one sees it yet, but they will soon enough. The chairman of the Committee on Analysis of Ideas and Study of Methods is just has just been shot down in his own classroom. Now he is speechless, and he can't think of a word to say. The silence which, which so built his, his image in the beginning of the class is now destroying it. He doesn't understand from where that shot com uh, has come. He's never confronted a living sophist, only dead ones. Now he tries to grasp onto something, but there is nothing to grasp onto. His own momentum carries him forward into the abyss, and when he finally finds words, they are the words of another kind of person. A schoolboy who has forgotten his lesson, has gotten it wrong, but would like our indulgence anyway. He tries to bluff the class at the statement he made before um, that no one has studied very well, but the student to Phaedrus' right shakes his head at him. Obviously someone has. The chairman falters and hesitates, uh, acts afraid of, of his class, and does not really engage them. Phaedrus wonders if the consequence, what the consequence of this will be. Then he sees a bad thing happen. The beat-up, innocent student who has watched him earlier now is no longer innocent. And is no longer so innocent. He is sneering at the chairman and asking him uh, sarcastic and insinuating questions. The chairman, already crippled, is now being killed. But then Phaedrus realizes this. This was what he was intended for himself. He can't feel sorry, just disgusted. When a shepherd goes to kill a wolf he, and takes his dog to see the sport, he should take care to avoid mistakes. The dog has certain relationships to the wolf, if the shepherd may have forgotten. A girl rescues the chairman by asking easy questions. He receives the questions with gratitude, answers each with, at length and great, and slowly recovers himself. Then the question is asked him, what is dialectic? He thinks about it, and then, by God, turns to Phaedrus and asks if he would care to answer. You mean my personal opinion? Phaedrus asks. No, let us say Aristotle's opinion. No subtleties now. He is just going to get Phaedrus on his own territory and let him have it. As best I know, Phaedrus says and pauses. Yes, chairman. Uh, the chairman is all smiles. Everything is all set. As best I know, Aristotle's opinion is that dialectic comes before everything else. The chairman exp chairman's expression goes from uh, unction to shock uh, to rage in one half second flat. It does, his face shouts, but he never says it. The trapper tapped again. He can't kill Phaedrus in the statement taken from his own article on the in, on the Encyclopedia Britannica. Rhetoric 2, dialectic 0. And from the dialectic comes forms, Phaedrus continues, and from, but the chairman cuts it off. He sees it cannot go his way and dismisses it. He shouldn't have cut it off, Phaedrus thinks to himself. Where a real, real truth seeker is not a propagandist for a particular point of view, he would not. He might learn something once it's stated that the dialectic comes before anything else. His statement itself becomes a dialectical entity, uh, subject to dialectical question. Phaedrus would have asked, what ev evidence do we have that the dialectical question and answer method of arriving at truth comes before anything else? We have none whatsoever. And then the statement is isolated in itself, subject to scrutiny, and it becomes patently, ridicu patent patently ridiculous. Here is this dialectic, like Newton like Newton's law of gravity, just sitting by itself in the middle of nowhere, giving birth to the universe, hey? It's asinine. Dialectic, which is the parent of logic, came for itself from rhetoric. Rhetoric is in turn the child of myths and poetry in ancient Greece. Um, of ancient, ancient Greece. That is so historically that, um, and that is so by any application of common sense. The poetry and the myths are the re are response are the response of a prehistoric people to the universe around them, made on the basis of quality. It is quality, not dialectic, which is the generator of everything uh, we know. The class ends, and the chairman stands by the door answering questions, and Phaedrus almost goes up to say something, but does not. A lifetime of blows tends to make a person unenthusiastic about any un un unnecessary interchange that might lead to more. Nothing friendly has been said or even hinted at, so much, uh, at and so much hosti hostility has been shown. Phaedrus the wolf, it fits. Walking back to his apartment with light steps, he sees it fits more and more. He wouldn't be happy if they were overjoyed at, with the thesis. Hostility is really his element. It really is. Phaedrus the wolf, yes. Down from the mountains to prey upon the poor, innocent citizens of, of this intellectual, intellectual community. It fits all right. The Church of Reason, like all institutions of the system, is based on uh, individual strength, it's not on individual strength, but upon individual weakness. What's really demanded of the Church of Reason is not ability, but inability. When you are considered teachable, a truly able person is always a threat. Phaedrus sees that 
he has thrown away any chance to integrate himself um, to, into the organization by submitting to whatever Aristotelian thing he is supposed to submit to. But that kind of opportunity seems hardly worth the bowing and scraping an intellectual prostration necessary to maintain it. It is a low-quality form of life. For him, quality is better seen uh, up at the timberline than here, obscur obscured by smoky windows and oceans of words. And he sees that um, that what he's talking about can never really be accepted here, because um, to see it, uh, to see it, one to see it, one has to be free from social authority, and this is an institution of social authority. Quality for sheep is what the shepherd says, and if you take a sheep and put it up in the timberline at night, and when the wind is roaring, that sheep will be panicked half to death and will call and call until the shepherd comes, or comes the wolf. He makes one last attempt uh, somehow to be nice at the next uh, session of the class, but the chairman isn't having any. Phaedrus asks him to explain the point, saying he hasn't been able to understand it. He has, but thinks that it would be nice to defer a little bit. To defer a little. The answer is maybe you got tired. Delivered as scathingly as possible, but it doesn't scathe. The chairman is simply condemning in Phaedrus um, that which he most fears himself. As the class goes on, Phaedra sits staring at the window and feeling sorry for his old shepherd in the classroom, sheep and dogs, and sorry for himself that he will never be one of them. Then, when the bell rings, he leaves forever. The classes at Navy Pier, by contrast, are going like wildfire. The students now listening intently to a strange, bearded figure from the mountains who is telling him there is such a thing as quality in this universe, and they know, and they know what it is. They don't know what to make of it, are unsure, some of them afraid of him, and they can see he is somehow dangerous. But all are fascinated and want to hear more. But Phaedrus is no shepherd either, and the strain of behaving like one is killing him. A strange thing uh, that has always occurred in classes occurs again, which is unruly and wild students in the back rows have always empathized with him and been his favorites, while more sheepish and, sheepish and obedient students in the front rows have always been terrorized by him, and are because of this... Uh, and, and are because of this objects of his contempt, even though at the end the sheep may, uh, sh the sheep have passed and his unruly unruly friends in the back rows have not. And Phaedra sees, though he does not want to admit it himself even now, he sees intuitively and nevertheless that his days as a shepherd are coming to an end too, and he wonders more and more what is going to happen next. He has always feared the silence in the classroom, the sort that has destroyed the chairman. He is not. It is not his nature to talk and talk, and talk for hours and on end, and it exhausts him to do this. And now, having nothing left to turn upon, he f turns upon this fear. He comes to the classroom, the bell rings, and Phaedra sits there and does not talk. For the entire hour, he is silent. Some of the students challenge him a little to wake him up, but then are silent. Others are not going straight out of their minds with internal panic. At the end of the hour, the whole class literally breaks and runs for the door. Then he goes to his next class, and the same thing happens. And the next class, and the next. Then Phaedrus goes home, and he wonders more and more what is going to happen next. Thanksgiving comes. His four hours of sleep have dwindled down to two, and then to nothing. It is all over. He will not be going back to the study of Aristotelian rhetoric. Neither will he return to the teaching of that subject. It is over. He begins to walk the streets, his mind spinning. The city closes in on him now. And in his strange perspective, it becomes the antithesis of what he believes. The citadel not of quality, the citadel of form and substance. Substance in the form of steel sheets and girders, and substance in the form of concrete, pier concrete piers and roads, in the form of brick, of asphalt, of auto parts, old radios and rails, dead carcasses of animals that once grazed the prairies. From substance without quality. Form and substance without quality. That is the soul of this place blind, huge, sinister, and inhuman, seen by the light of fire flare, flaring upward at night from the blast furnaces in the south, through heavy coal smoke and deeper and denser into the neon of beer and pizza and laundromat signs and unknown and meaningless signs among meaningless straight streets, going off into other straight streets forever. If it was all bricks and con concrete, pure forms of substance, clearly and openly, he might survive. It is the little pathetic attempts that quality that kill. The plaster false, the plaster false pl fireplace in the apartment, shaped and waiting to contain a flame that can never exist, or the hedge in front of the apartment. Ooh, fuck! Oh, damn. Um, sorry, hold on.
Uh, it is the little, the plaster false fireplace in the apartment shaped and waiting to contain a flame that can never exist. Or the hedge in front of the apartment building with the new square of feet, uh, square feet of grass behind it. A few square, and a few square feet of grass after Montana. They just left, um, out the hedge and the grass. Uh, if they just left out the hedge, um, and grass, it would look all right. Now it serves only to draw attention to what has been lost. Along the streets that lead away from the apartment, uh, he can never see anything through the concrete and brick and neon, but he knows that buried within it are grotesque, twisted souls forever trying the, um, trying the manners that will convince themselves they possess, possess quality, learning the strained poses of style and glamour vended by dream magazines and other mass media, and paid for by vendors of substance. He thinks of them at night, alone in their advertised glamour shoes and stockings and underclothes, off, staring through sooty windows at grotesque shells revealed beyond them, which she poses weak in the truth creeps in, weak in and the truth creeps in, and only truth that exists here, crying to heaven, God, there is nothing here but dead neon cement and brick. His time uh, consciousness begins to go too, begins to go, his time consciousness begins to go. Sometimes his thoughts race on at a speed seeming to approach that of light, but when he tries to make decisions relating to his surroundings, he seems to take a whole minutes for a single thought to emerge. A single thought begins to grow in his mind, extracted from something he read in the dialogue, Phaedrus. In the dialogue, Phaedrus. And what is written well, and what is written badly, need we ask Lysias or any other um, poet or orator who ever wrote, or, ever, or will write either a political or other work, in meter or out of meter, poet or prose writer, to teach us this. What is good, Phaedrus, and what is not good? We need, need we ask anyone to tell us these things? It is what he was saying months before in the classroom in Montana, a message Plato and every dialectician since him had been missed, since they all thought, sought to define God and its intellectual, rela intellectual relation to things. But what he sees now is, um, is how far he has come from that. He is doing the same bad things himself. His original goal was to keep quality undefined, but in the process of battling um, against dialecticians, he has made statements, and each statement has been a brick and a wall of definition he himself has been building around quality. Any attempt to develop an organized reason around undefined quality defeats its own purpose. The organization of reason itself defeats the quality. Everything he has been doing has been fool's mission to begin with. On the third day, he turns a corner in, uh, at an intersection of unknown streets and his vision blank blanks out. When it returns, he is lying in the sidewalk. People are moving around him as if he were not there. He gets up wearily and mercilessly and drives his thoughts to remember the way back to the apartment. They're slowing down. Slowing down. This is about time he and Chris try to find the cellars of bunk beds for the children to sleep in. And after that, he does not leave the apartment. He stares at a wall in a cross-legged position upon a quilted blanket on the floor of a bedless bedroom. All bridges have been burned. There is no way back. And now there is no way forward either. For three days and three nights, Fader stares at the wall of the bedroom, his thoughts moving neither forward nor backward, staying only at an instant. At the instant. His wife asks if he is sick, and he does not answer. His wife becomes angry, but Phaedra listens without responding. He is aware of what she says, but is no longer able to feel any urgency about it. Not only are his thoughts slowing down, but his desires too. They slow and slow, as if gaining an imponderable mass, so heavy, so tired, when no sleep comes. He feels like a giant, a million miles tall. He feels himself extending to the universe with no limit. He begins to discard things, encumbrances he, that he has carried with him all his life. He tells his wife to leave with the children, to consider themselves separated. Fear and loathsomeness and shame disappear with, when his urine flows not deliberately, but not naturally on the floor of the room. Fear of pain, the pain of the martyrs, is overcome when cigarettes burn not deliberately, but naturally down to his fingers until they are extinguished by the blisters formed by their own heat. His wife sees his injured hands and the urine on the floor and calls for help. But before help comes, slowly, imperceptibly at first, the entire consciousness of Phaedrus begins to come apart, to dissolve and fade away. Then gradually he no longer wonders what will happen next. He knows what will happen next, and the tears flow for his family and for himself and for the world. A fragment comes and lingers for an old Christian hymn. You've got to cross that lonesome valley. It carries him forward. You've got to cross it by yourself. 
It seems a western hymn that belongs out of, belongs out in Montana. No one else can cross it for you, it says. It seems to suggest something beyond. You've got to cross it by yourself. He crosses a lonesome valley, out of the mythos, and emerges, and emerges as if from a dream, seeing that his whole consciousness, the mythos, has been a dream and no one's dream but his own. A dream he must now sustain um, of sustain of his own efforts. Then even he disappears, and only the dream of himself remains with, with himself in it. And the quality, the arete, he has fought the arete he has fought so hard for, has sacrificed for, has never betrayed, but in all that time has never once understood, now makes itself clear to him, and his soul is at rest. The cars are thinned out to almost none, and the road is so black it seems as though the headlight can barely fight its way through the rain to reach it. Murderous. Anything can happen. A sudden rut, an oil slick, a dead animal. But if you go too slowly, they'll kill you for, from behind. I don't know why we still go on, on in this. Uh, we should have stopped long ago. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I was looking for some sign of a motel, I guess, but not thinking about it and missing them. If we keep on like this, um, they'll all close. We take the next exit from the freeway, hoping it will lead somewhere. And soon we're on a bumpy blacktop with ruts and loose gravel. I go slowly. Street lamps overhead throw swinging arcs, arcs of sodium light through the sheets of rain. We pass light into into shadow, into light into shadow again, without a single sign of welcome anywhere. A sign announces stop to our left, but does not tell which way to turn. One way looks as dark as the other. We could go endlessly through these streets and not find anything, and now not even find the freeway again. Where are we? Chris shouts. I don't know. My mind has become tired and slow. I can't seem to think of the right answer, or what to do next. Now I see ahead a white glow, and a bright sign of filling, uh, of a filling station far down the street. It's open. We pull up and go inside. The attendant, who looks like Chris's age, <laughs> who looks Chris's age, watches us strangely. He doesn't know of any motel, and I go to the telephone direc directory and find some, uh, find some and tell him the street addresses. Um, he tries to give directions, but they're poor. I call the motel. Uh, he says is closest to make a reservation and confirm the directions. In the rain and the dark streets, even with the directions, we almost miss it. They have turned the light out, and when, uh, and when I register, nothing is said. The room is a remnant of the bleakness of the thirties, sordid, homemade by a person who doesn't know carpentry, but it's dry, has a heater and beds, and that's all we want. I turn on the heater, and we sit before it, um, and soon the chills and shivers and damp start to leave our bones. Chris doesn't look up, and just stares into the grill of the hall theater, uh, the grill of the, whole, the wall heater. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then after a while, he says, when are we going back home? Failure. Period. When we get to San Francisco, I said, Why? I'm so tired of just sitting in. His voice is trailed off. And what? And, I don't know, just sitting. Like we're not really going anyplace. Where should we go? I don't know. How should I know? I don't know either, I say. Well, why don't you? He says and begins to cry. What's the matter, Chris? I ask. He doesn't answer when he puts his head in his hands and rocks back and forth. The way he does the way he does it gives me an eerie feeling. After a while he stops and says When I was a little, it was different. How? I don't know. We always did things that I wanted to do. Now I don't want to do anything. He continues to rock back and forth in an eerie way, with his face in his hands, and I don't know what to do. It's a strange, unworldly rocking motion, a fetal self enclosure that seems to shut me out. To shut everything out. I return to somewhere that I don't know about. The bottom of the ocean. Now I know where I have seen it before. On the floor of the hospital. I don't know of anything to do. After a while we get in our beds and I try to sleep. Then I ask Chris. Chris. Was it better before we left Chicago? Yes. How? What do you remember? That was fun. Fun? Yes, he says, and is quiet. Then he says, remember the time we went to look for beds? That was fun? <laughs> sure, he says, and is quiet for a long time. And then he says, don't you remember? You made, me find all, uh, you made me find all the directions home. You used to play games with us. You used to tell 
us all kinds of stories, and we'd go on rides and do things, and now you don't do anything. Yes, I do. No, you don't. You just sit and stare, and you don't do anything. I hear him crying again. Outside, the rain comes and gusts against the window, and I feel kind of heavy pressure bear down on me. He's crying for him. It's him he misses. That's what he, the dream is about. In the dream. For what seems like a long time, I continue to listen to the creaking sound of the wall heater and the wind and the rain against the roof and the window. When the rain dies away, and there's nothing left but a few drops of water the, uh, from the trees moving in an occasional gust of wind.